Good morning, uh, everyone. Welcome to uh, the third session from Everything Alliance. Uh, the topic is capital ablation. We're going to start promptly because it is a very tight schedule. Only 10 minutes per presentation. We have to finish on time. The first speaker is Dr. Julian Jarman. The title is Should We Ablate Age of Ablation Before It Has Even Happened? Thank you, Tom. Um, so this title was slightly jokey uh, in a conversation I was having with Shuvik, and then to my horror, he put it as the title of my talk. Um, and it was really intended just to provoke debate and uh, food for thought rather than uh, making particular suggestions or giving answers today. Um, so we know that AF is bad for you. We can't prove it but it's strongly associated with bad outcomes. And in particular, once you get into persistent AF, the main, the main negative, as well as the stroke, is the heart failure. And this is back of an envelope calculation rather than from real data. But broadly, if you look at the trials, if you work out the 10-year stroke risks, they're rather high. And if you even take away the effect of anticoagulation, you get left with pretty high residual 10-year stroke risks from AF on your apixaban. And we also know that AF is progressive. So each of these is a randomized trial. Forget the red line, they got ablated. But if you look at the blue line, they're all randomized trials. And they, they're just trials where they're looking at people who have paroxysmal AF, did not have ablation. They follow them up over the years, and they see that everybody tends to progress towards persistent AF, which we know. And we also know uh, that ablation works. So if you compare it with antiarrhythmic drugs across multiple trials, randomized trials, if you do a meta-analysis of those trials, and even if you compare with amiodarone, uh, you're getting two to three times the efficacy of having drugs. And we know from last month from the ESC that even more importantly, that ablation prevents you from progressing to persistent AF, and it's 10 times more effective than antiarrhythmic drugs, and the actual rate of progression to persistent AF is pretty minimal. And this is from our data. If you take 5,000 on each side, well-matched patients, and you track them back before they had AF, they have very similar low stroke risks, so you know that you have matched them well. And if you look at the onset of AF, they have similar high stroke risks, still showing that they're well matched. But if you look at them, track them after diverging between the group who had ablation and the group who didn't, you can see the stroke risks are completely different and the ablated group fall to similar to a pre-AF stroke risk. And now we know from Cabana that even, you know, allowing for all the different arguments about intention to treat analysis, and I'll come back to that later, that if you look on a treatment received basis, so you did actually get ablated, that you have less death and stroke and bleeding, et cetera, and that the benefit is greater in younger patients and those with heart failure. So the other thing we know is that it's better to ablate early, and, and there are so many studies saying that, I'll just pick out two of them, but they're all agreed. If you ablate when the left atrium is small, if you ablate when you're paroxysmal, if you ablate at an early stage, you get a better result. And in addition, we also know that um, this thing doesn't work. That ablation these days is pretty safe. So things have changed, really. These were the old data. When we look at 1,000 cases now, the risk of you having a catastrophe, uh, irreversible complication, it's about one in 500. And that is exactly reproduced in Cabana across many different centers, about one in 500, that you have a stroke or something very bad like that. And so if we know all of that, you tend to think, why follow this old kind of pattern of AF management where we know that AF is probably occurring prior to it being diagnosed. Um, and if you, there are studies where you look at people in that phase 
we're pretty sure that they're getting these events happening, silent, ischemic, brain lesions, etc., etc. So what if we were to take this and instead change it to this and move the ablation forward, would we end up with this? So you've got the odd bit of AF in the future. You may or may not need the anticoagulation. You don't need all those other treatments. So there are lots of logical reasons why it may be a good idea to ablate AF before it's even diagnosed. And, you know, it sounds a bit crazy and you think, well, have we ever tested this in a trial? And yes, we have. So we've got this randomized trial, patients with typical flutter, they've never had AF uh, documented, diagnosed, and you either do the flutter plus PVI or you just do the CTI and they do much better and the complication is the same. And you could say that was a small trial uh, with 50 patients, but actually there are four trials like that. So you've actually got 550 patients, complications, no significant, statistically significant difference and much better result in terms of the rhythm outcome at any rate. And so then you think, well, what about other populations who you know are very likely to get AF? You know, patients with flutter is one population. Uh, but what about patients with heart failure? So they're very likely to get AF as the heart failure progresses. Um, and we know if you ablate these patients that you have huge mortality benefit. What about this type of person? We've all got patients like this in clinic, you know, 20% atrial ectopy burden, lots of short runs. You're pretty sure they're gonna get AF. And if you look at the various HALTER studies, they show, you know, risk of AF might be five times in some studies, two to three in most of them. But these are studies where they define a high ectopy burden as being 0.7%. But, you know, we've all got patients in clinic with 10, 20, 30% burden. And also these people are likely to respond very well to PVI, aren't they? I mean, it's the perfect treatment for them. Um, and they have a higher stroke risk than other people similar to a patient who's been diagnosed with AF. And there are so many others you could think of uh, who have a high risk, and you could even make a scoring system of which there are some, but they could certainly be better. So at the end of all that, would I do this? Uh, not really. <laughs> so I have done it, some patients, but I'm not saying today that I think you should do this in everybody. Um, I don't even do it in the flutter patients, personally, even though they, we've got RCT evidence, they've got very high AF risk, you're already doing an ablation. I don't standardly do that. And the reason I don't is because, I mean, firstly, there's this sort of philosophical thing, you know, do you want your risk up front or do you prefer to pay in installments at a premium where they cost a bit more than paying up front? And there's many reasons in people's lives they may prefer instalments. Secondly, about the stroke risk point, you know, having ectopy has a higher stroke risk. We do not know that that's cause and effect. Um, the important points about the AF progression. So I'm kind of working on the basis that I think people will become symptomatic and will tell me about it and will move on to a PVI at that point. And in a way, Cabana tells us that that's fine because that's the point of this business of the intention to treat analysis is that the fact that that had no difference is really saying that if you start off in either group, you know, if you start in the group who do not have ablation, as long as you switch over at the right moment, you'll end up with the same outcome. And you can sort of shift the question and say, you know, should they have a Pixaban? Is that more important question? There are some RCTs on that. But I'm not sure that I'm right not to do it. <laughs> so I don't think it would be crazy to do at all. Um, I think it's very possible that it is the right thing to do to ablate before diagnosis. You'll probably never get the trials. Um, I think you are exposed to risk while you're waiting for your AF to be diagnosed. And if you've got a CHADS VASC of seven, and your cardiologist hasn't got a mandate to put you on anticoagulation because you haven't got AF. Um, that's a lot of risk. Um, 
the other thing with Cabana is, you know, they did fine if they swapped to ablation, but they're carefully followed up. You know, their AF is going to get diagnosed. They're, you know, able to swap to ablation. But if you're moving to Scotland or something and you're not going to get an ablation, I sometimes can think of one patient thought, well, let's get it done now because it may not be so easy to switch group. And the other thing is the fact that Cabana didn't find a difference doesn't tell you that it wouldn't be better because Cabana was actually pretty late stage ablation. You know, most of them were persistent already. So in practice, what to do? I think we probably won't get RCTs, but I'd love to do one in heart failure. Um, I occasionally do it. I've done it occasionally with CTI cases, occasionally with very high to be burden cases, sort of pretending it's a treatment for symptoms uh, and rarely in heart failure. Um, and I think there's things that might push you towards it are the younger patients, those less able to identify symptoms in future or get, get access to care um, and higher chance of ask. So in summary, I think there are good reasons it might make sense. There is an RCT. We don't have evidence in most patients and whether to do it is very situational and I'm not generally <coughs> recommending it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so a very um, provocating um, yeah. title, compelling this, uh, a presentation, an argument, and a very sensible conclusion, I thought. Any question, maybe just one question that you have. A friendly question while we are getting a doctor taught at the second speaker. Um, the very tight schedule, 10 minutes per presentation. While we're setting up the Ferris slides, any questions for Julian? Where do you see Julian of lifestyle modification in the scheme of ablating early uh, in patient patriarchation? I, I always think that's critical before and after ablation, um, and I inc include hypertension control within that. So I think sort of alcohol, obesity, hypertension. If you sort out the alcohol, you often fix the other two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very true. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. So the next speaker is uh, Dr. Derek Thomas, who's the Kaiser's High Power. Short duration ablation, is it ready for the passion? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the organisers for the invitation to speak on this. Uh, so I've only got a bit, I've got about 10 minutes to talk to you about this uh, new technology, which uh, I think is coming for ablation. And uh, I think it's something that we're all going to be excited about uh, when it does arrive for us. Uh, um, and it's probably not this kind of prime time it's ready for, but uh, hopefully uh, time in our lab. So what is high power short duration ablation? Uh, if you look at standard ablation here on the left, the majority of standard ablation happens initially with resistive heat, heating, but then the conduction of that heat through the tissue to form the lesion. When you change to a high power short duration ablation, you give a much higher power, you get a lot more resistive heating and a lot less conductive heating. Now what that means practically is that you form a lesion which is a slightly different shape uh, to what you get with standard ablation. And you can even see within the diagram here that it's perhaps drawn a little shallower uh, than what we have with standard ablation. There's always been a concern though that if we ablate with high powers that we will get very high temperatures on the tissue and if we do get high temperatures in the tissue, particularly over 65 degrees, we're going to get steam pops, we're going to get char, char will result in thrombus, particles on the left atrium and then you will have issues. But if we can do shorter ablations, of course, we have potential for shorter procedures. And if we make a lesion that perhaps is a little bit more shallow, then we have the opportunity perhaps to do uh, more in the back of the left atrium without worrying about the esophagus. And certainly looking at some of the lines that um, my colleagues at the Brompton are drawing after they make their maps, uh, they're doing a lot in the back of the left atrium, so they're gonna want to make sure they're nice and safe there. And we've got some evidence coming 
uh, about 50 watts. Uh, we certainly have seen that the, uh, the initial lessons that were learned about left atrial ablation from the Bordeaux group in the 90s into the early 2000s when they said you have to stick at 35, you can't go up to 50. I think we're seeing now that uh, with the technology we have where we can judge contact on the tissue better. Many people are using 50 watts. People are reporting the literature good outcomes. And certainly in our center, uh, we have operators using 50 watts routinely for left atrial ablation, and it's reducing the time that they have to ablate in the left atrium. Now, if you're going to do this kind of high powered ablation, you're going to need a catheter that is different to what we have now. And this is what the catheter is. It's called Q dot. The biggest difference with this catheter is the fact that it's got six thermocouples in it. So it is very good at sensing the temperature. If you have one thermocouple in the middle of the catheter, which is what we have now, it's quite difficult for the catheter to accurately assess temperature. Whereas when you have six, you have a real ability to sense temperature accurately and thereby prevent, we hope, giving lesions which result in too high a temperature, char, steam, etc. Another nice adaptation of this new catheter is that it has three microelectrodes on the end, which will allow us a lot better uh, mapping with this catheter when we use it. But you have to combine this with a generator that's going to be able to do this. And uh, so there's also a new generator, uh, which will deliver high powers, that's up to 90 watts straight away. And uh, we'll be able to look at the temperature from these thermocouples and feedback, change the power delivery and change the irrigation through the catheter. And this is also changed with this catheter. The, the way the irrigation ports come out is changed as well to try to, to give us better cooling. And this is the kind of spectrum you're going to have. So look at the right hand side here. Power is in red, temperature is in blue. And you come along, you turn your power on, and this is a temperature controlled ablation, not a power controlled ablation. So therefore power goes straight up uh, pretty much to 90 watts. You're at 90 watts before one second. Um, and you can see temperature begins to rise pretty quickly. And here the maximum temperature has been set at 60. So once the, the temperature becomes, is coming above there, you can see that very quickly the ablator will drop the power down. It will also influence irrigation at that point in time to prevent char. So it's, it's definitely got the technology there that is gonna help us do this. And we are gonna be able to deliver a lesion in four seconds. Pretty good. What does the lesion look like when you look at it experimentally? And this is uh, data from a thigh muscle preparation. And it's a pretty standard way that we look at how we form ablation lesions. So if you look at the ablation lesion here with the 90 watts in four seconds, you can see that it's not a deep lesion. It's about three to four millimeters. If you ablate longer, you get more conductive heating and therefore a deeper lesion. So you can see that you can compare that to a longer 90 watt lesion or a, a longer 70 watt lesion. The, the surface area covered by the lesion is pretty similar. So you're certainly gonna do a pretty wide and superficial burn. But you have to recognize that that is quite different to what you're getting with the current generation of biosense catheters when you're doing 35 to 50 watt lesions for 30 seconds, because then you're going to get a, de a depth of seven, eight, maybe even nine millimeters. So this lesion is different. And that's a key fundamental aspect of this, uh, this catheter. What does it look like when you take the hearts out of animals when you've done lines? So you can certainly see what sh high power short duration looks like. It looks like there's been napalm poured down the inside of this right atrium. It looks quite different to what our conventional ablations look like. Um, so we know that we have a different kind of lesion here. It looks attractive for a contiguous lesion, doesn't it? Certainly uh, in, in this format. So we think that it's going to be good for doing PBI. Clinical data. Well, we have some clinical data now, which is great. Uh, it's been studied in a, uh, by in a multi-center uh, trial around Europe, which is uh, being published now. And there were 52 patients at seven sites, pretty typical PATH population. But the, 
the team doing the trial decided only to look at the acute efficacy and safety and didn't decide to do lots of monitoring afterwards to really understand how, how effective it was. It seemed an almost bizarre decision. I don't quite get it, but anyway. Um, they did a lot of safety work as well, including MRI scans within 72 hours before and then after as well. And what they found was that they could do PVI pretty effectively with this, but not perfectly. So the same catheter that does the high power short duration ablation, the QDOT catheter, we can use it to deliver a normal lesion, but we couldn't achieve PVI uh, in every patient with high power short duration. 11 of them needed to convert to normal uh, ablation, as in giving a longer duration, lower power ablation lesion in order to generate a, a deeper lesion. So procedure durations were short though, RF duration was short, uh, and a number of the veins require some touch-up. Uh, maybe a little bit of concern there that perhaps some of these lesions aren't as long-lasting, hard to know. But look at the ablation procedure time total left atrial time, fluoro time, and RF time in comparison to some of the, I have to say, rather older um, previous trials where catheters were looking for CE marks uh, or, or FDA approval. Um, we've definitely got something here that gives us a streamlined procedure. You can imagine going round the veins pretty quickly with this catheter. What about adverse events? It was pretty safe, this catheter. There was one MRI lesion, uh, which is significant, uh, although the patient did not have any neurological symptoms, so this would be defined as an asymptomatic cerebral event. Um, uh, there was one esophageal ulcer. I never quite know what to make of that. Um, you know, the patients only have endoscopy after the procedure, not before, so it's always hard to know if it could have been something there anyway. I think this, this is much less likely to affect the esophagus. And we do have a little bit of a feel of clinical efficacy because 94% of the patients were in sinus rhythm at three months. So, so I think we have a, a really good idea that we can do PVI with this catheter. It looks attractive in terms of its workflow. Um, it looks like it's safe, uh, but further data on clinical e efficacy, especially three, maybe six month data to really know that the lesion, when it's mature, is effective, not just acutely, I think will be important. Um, and it perhaps gives us something that will be ready for prime time soon. Thank you. So good morning, um, I'm talking about AF and heart failure. My Subtitle uh, was overlooked and underablated. I appreciate I'm probably talking to preaching to the converted in this audience, but I have a disclosure that I believe that normal sinus rhythm must be best. And based upon that, I have a rather balanced approach to managing AF in heart failure. Uh, just do the ablation. I always have too many slides, I'll try and get through them uh, promptly. Um, hashtag AF is heart failure. Um, William Harvey got this right. You need your atria to contract to send your blood on with greater vigor, and we all want greater vigor. Uh, AF occurs in uh, increasing prevalence and incidence as the uh, uh, prevalence and severity of heart failure increases with all of these problems. These are historic data, um, but they do apply quite well in the modern era as uh, diagnosis detection of heart failure increases as well. Consequences, we all know this, the holy trinity of AF, or the unholy trinity of AF, loss of atrial contraction, which is one of the reasons why just controlling the rate and zapping that AV node is not sufficient in all our patients. Obviously, the irregularity and rate are also important. We don't quite know what the rate target should be. AF can cause, uh, sorry, heart failure can cause AF via a, a mixture of electrical and mechanical remodeling that remains incompletely understood. AF can cause heart failure, so-called tachycardia-related cardiomyopathy. As you will see, uh, that isn't necessarily ventricular high rate related. It may be the AF itself, and a so-called AF-related cardiomyopathy via a number of mechanisms. Uh, I've highlighted mitral regurgitation as there are emerging data that that is uh, worsened by AF and can be corrected. We can potentially target interruption of that vicious electromechanical cycle. AF is heart failure. So does AF cause heart failure or heart failure cause AF? And we will see many patients where uh, there is a degree of heart failure and AF exacerbates that. Which came first, does it matter? I would argue not in many cases. 
AF is bad news in heart failure. You can look at the data, and those of you who've looked into this will see that there is a difference in prevalent AF versus incident AF when you look at the epidemiological data and the clinical trial data. Um, but uh, the fact remains, incident AF is bad for you. Uh, prevalent AF in uh, epidemiological terms and uh, trial terms may actually be a self-selecting, healthier population who has survived uh, instant AF to become prevalent AF. I won't touch further on that, but I will point out that, uh, for instance, AF is not only bad for you in terms of uh, that uh, overall mortality risk, but it negated the effects of an ICD and scud heft. Let's not forget, it's pretty bad news. What can be done? We can prevent it. We can reduce stroke risk. We can reduce its negative hemodynamic impact, which is a posh way of saying rate control, and we can restore and maintain sinus rhythm. So we, we know AF is preventable. This is early data from uh, studies like Solved and Merit showing that you can prevent incident AF with adequate heart failure therapy versus placebo. We know we can prevent it by a number of lifestyle interventions. That's relevant as much, if not more, in heart failure patients. We can reduce stroke risk, anticoagulate. Don't whisper it too loudly. If you're rhythm control, you might be able to reduce that risk as well. Um, we can reduce the hemodynamic impact, we can rate control. We don't, still don't know, even in 2019, what the target should be for rate control, but there are data from the CRT population that AV node ablation helps improve the outcomes in that population of patients. Who knows what the future holds with his bundle in that regard? We can restore sinus rhythm. Of course, I'm not going to suggest for a minute that rhythm control is AF ablation. And I'm not necessarily suggesting that when we say we're overlooking AF in heart failure, I'm not overlooking AF ablation. I think what is often overlooked is that AF could be a significant contrib contributor, and in, indeed in several cases, in many cases. The cause, if patients co-present with AF in heart failure, just don't discount it. Uh, optimal heart failure therapy, DC cardioversion, antiretic drugs, they're all options, but we all know they haven't done the job in clinical trials. AFCHF was the biggest trial looking at the pharmacological and DC cardioversion approach. It just didn't seem to work, but we have to be wary that there wasn't much of a difference between uh, the rhythm in each of the groups, after all. Sinus rhythm might be better, but there's always been the argument that sinus rhythm is a confounder in a self-selecting healthier population, but it has shown all these improvements at outcome. So this is why we look down the route of ablation in heart failure. Early studies, case control, observational, looking at Ejection fraction, even improved in paroxysmal AF patients, indicating a degree of AF-related cardiomyopathy uh, that is not necessarily requiring AF to be constant. PABA-CHF, looking at PVI versus AV node uh, and CRT, um, showing PVI was superior. Uh, a number of studies, obviously a rather elegant one from the Royal Brompton Harefield, uh, looking at uh, management of persistent AF in heart failure uh, with AF ablation and looking at physiological outcomes, significant improvements in peak oxygen consumption. Uh, a number of uh, physiological markers, outcomes that are improved uh, by those in those studies. However, that's not really enough. But let's just look at an example of one of those. 50-year-old male, heart failure, family history. You think this is going to be genetic? It may well be. In fact, his gene panels were negative, but who knows what future genetic testing might hold in that regard. Worsening heart failure. Failure of rhythm control with DC cardioversion amiodarone, poor ejection fraction, rate control, still poor ejection fraction. What do we do? He was referred for transplant assessment, but he was also referred to the RKHF trial. This was his outcome. Obviously, I'm showing you one of the nice results here, but look what happens. This is quite a common finding. Atrial dilatation regresses, mitral regurgitation regresses, ventricular dilatation regresses, cardiac function improves. 50% improvement in his case. Okay, I'm showing you a good example. Seven years free of atrial arrhythmia. Ejection fraction only mildly impaired. No hospital admissions. This is not unusual. We also know that uh, heart failure patients do not represent a harder to treat cohort. In fact, there are some data, um, produced by one of my colleagues here, showing that uh, it may be easier to treat some of these patients. This could be because they present without needing uh, as much advancement of their primary atrial myopathy. So we need to look at outcomes for hard endpoints. Obviously, you know uh, that the first study to really look at this, although as a secondary endpoint, was the ATAC study, uh, primarily looking at whether ablation was better than amyloid. I think we already knew that, but this confirmed it. Also showed as a secondary endpoint, reduced mortality. We needed a primary endpoint design study, which was Castle AF. You all know the results of that. 
The outcome was too good, I hear my heart failure colleagues say. Uh, the effect size was too great. Where are those patients? But I would argue that the potentially the differential effect of AF uh, it beats any drug any day if you can restore sinus rhythm. Yes, it's cheating. Drugs are great. Pharma trials need to be big so they can show those significant p-values. Obviously, I'm being devil's advocate. And I would also be devil's advocate in suggesting that you might not need to treat your patients for heart failure if you treat that AF, although obviously that is the minority of co-presenting AF and heart failure patients. We need further trials. Raft AF um, will be one of those trials, but there are several smaller trials. The trouble is, these aren't going to be huge numbers. They will never be the size of the pharma trials. Can RCTs provide that answer? Recruitment, crossovers, duration of follow-up, outcomes. Do we need mortality outcomes in AF ablation to justify its use? Clearly we don't, because otherwise we would not necessarily be continuing to do it in all of our patients. However, we don't necessarily need to achieve that. If you could achieve neutral mortality, but improve quality of life, reduce hospital emissions, you'd take it, probably. Nevertheless, we have a positive mortality trial, so we need to embrace that with some degree of caution. If we look at the registry data, large scale, big data, looking at propensity matching, we see the benefits of AF ablation up front. Unfortunately, I missed my colleague's talk, but ablating AF before you get heart failure may prevent you having heart failure. We identify super responders to AF ablation. This was shown by a, a nice study looking at MRI data. If you don't have scar, you co-present with AF and heart failure. This is exactly the population I would encourage you to consider that AF may be the cause. These patients can normalize their cardiac function after rhythm control, albeit at the moment that's AF ablation, but rhythm control is key. What about diastolic heart failure? Well, how do we define that? Very difficult. Um, the definitions of a HEFPEF would actually cross over with many persistent AF patients, depending on how hard you look for all these things. So they're less studied, or they might not be. We may all be studying these patients whenever we treat people and study people with AF. We do have evidence that AF ablation is effective in both preserved and reduced ejection fractions. So in conclusion, we know AF and heart failure coexist, interact negatively, worsen prognosis. AF is bad. Of course, we need to apply upfront therapies, lifestyle modification, heart failure therapies, treating patients with devices where appropriate. We know there's no prognostic benefit of drug and cardioversion-based rhythm control versus rate control in clinical trials, and indeed in registries. In rhythm control, ablation beats amiodarone and AV node or CRT. It confers symptomatic and functional benefits. It confers mortality and hospitalization benefits. So considerations, obviously, a little disclaimer at the end, we must have a collaborative approach. I'm lucky I work in a centre where I have a constant daily collaborative approach with heart failure specialists. Indeed, many of my patients are referred to me by those specialists for ablation. I feel a certain safety net there. I would encourage you to collaborate accordingly. Many of these patients are discussed in advanced heart failure MDTs. Don't go alone. Make sure your heart failure therapy is optimised. We don't want to be accused of just focusing on the rhythm and consider complications and risk. High volume operators, high volume centers. If you're referring, it isn't necessary to be done when you're starting on your AF ablation programs. Conclusion, so is restoring sinus rhythm worth the effort? Are you wondering whether to accept AF, perhaps overlook AF even, or to rhythm control or ablate? Just follow the evidence, don't overlook it. And in many, but clearly not all cases, do it. AF ablation is heart failure, thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. So, yes, uh, I'm going to speak to you about air fibrillation and the limitations that we have with current uh, contemporary technologies and what things that we uh, may look forward to in the future. So, no disclosures. So, we know that air fibrillation has really exponentially risen in the last 20 years. This is data from the United States showing that between 2001 and 2013, of all the major ablation procedures, AF has risen. Uh, the most exponentially. And that's, con that's going to continue to occur given our elderly population of patients. So the evolution of air fibrillation has been an interesting journey. It started off with our surgical colleagues who um, 
started off with using a maze technique, which is a cut and sew surgical technique to compartmentalize the atrium and thereby isolate pulmonary veins, posterior wall. This was a uh, long uh, open heart procedure fraught with lots of complications, but the long-term outcomes were amazing, but never really took off uh, apart from with concomitant surgical procedures. And that was in the late 80s. In the late 90s, there was a seminal paper, obviously from Hassiger, which identified that pulmonary vein ectopy was a key finding in those with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And that was the key moment which heralded the era of pulmonary vein isolation and catheter-based interventions for AF. And of course, soon after, there was uh, the development of 3D electroanatomical maps to help guide us to conduct these PVI procedures. Some years later, probably about a decade later, I would say that the next main um, advance came, and that was with the advent of contact force sensing catheters to, for us to ablate with. This allowed real-time <coughs> catheter tip-to-tissue contact force assessment, which is clearly of benefit when, when creating your RF lesion, but also has a huge safety benefit because it allows you to, to uh, reduce back off the pressure if you're ablating to prevent things like steam pops and perforation. At around the same time, because point-by-point -point ablation takes time, there was a move to try and um, conduct multi-electrode ablation. And the two most well-known catheters for that were the PVAC and the NMARC catheter. But unfortunately, safety concerns prevented their development because there was a lot of cerebral emboli issues. And with the NMARC catheter, there was some atriosophageal fistula and mortality issues. So they never really took off. But on the same premise, um, balloon-based catheters for ablation, particularly for the, the cryoablation platform, were developed. And they are now routinely used and indeed have been shown particularly in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, to be as efficacious as RF ablation for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. This is a large randomized control trial um, showing these uh, results from 2016. But contact force is not the only story. Um, when you're ablating, you need to understand the time uh, spent at a particular area, the force imparted, um, and, the st and other factors such as stability cardiac respiratory motion. In order to try and sort of navigate those complex relationships, lesion prediction algorithms from uh, the major mapping systems have been developed, and they are uh, based upon weighted formulas which combine power, time, and contact force to give you an idea of what type of lesion you are creating as you're going along. And the idea being that this gives you a framework to standardize and allow reproducible ablation uh, outcomes. And indeed, if you use uh, these lesion prediction algorithms, such as ablation index and lesion specific index, studies have shown that you do get very high rates of durable PVI and excellent outcomes at one year. But all those parameters I've spoken about are not the only factors. You also need to make sure that you are very meticulous in your encircling path of lesions. So lesion contiguity is very important, and this is a very elegant study, the CLOSE study from a couple of years ago, with a small number of patients, but showing that if you used um, lesion prediction algorithms such as AI, as well as being meticulous in your interlesion distance, that again, you get very durable rates of PVI and excellent one-year outcomes. And we've seen in the last couple of years a real explosion in high-density mapping. The premise of mapping, of course, is the non-fluoroscopic visualization of your mapping and ablation catheters, as well as your reconstruction of geometry. But now with the advent of multi-electrode mapping catheters, such as the one shown, and also the pentaray, which is commonly used, you can now acquire multiple electrograms simultaneously. And these uh, mapping systems have inbuilt automated algorithms which have the ability to annotate these uh, signals with regard to voltage and activation. They're not always 100% perfect, but it allows you to create high density maps in a fairly quick time during your procedures. And this is all iterative and additive information when you're conducting AF and redo procedures. So where are we now? So that's kind of a quick run through of the major developments in the last 20 years. That's where we are now. And I think we have improved our outcomes. We do have less redo procedures. We certainly have reduced procedure times, and we have improved safety, as uh, Dr. Jarman showed us earlier. 
but we could do better in all those areas. Certainly for paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, I think we're in, a, we're in a position where we get fairly good and consistent results. But there is still a need to go back for a percentage of patients to finish the job with redo procedures. And that often entails pulmonary vein reconnections. When it comes to persistent AF, however, we still have a long way to go. This is a fairly recent meta-analysis, which is showing that single procedure success is in the region of 40 to 50 percent, rising to about 60 to 70 with multi-procedure um, outcomes. So there's still some way to go to improve our persistent AF cohort in terms of outcomes. So in terms of limitations, I think we need to get permanent transmural lesions with our RF um, techniques. We need to constantly improve safety, trying to eliminate damage to collateral structures. And we need to figure out a way to deal with persistent o AF over and above PVI. And of course, anything to make things quicker and more efficient is always welcome. We've already touched upon this with Dr. Todd's talk, high power short duration ablation. This essentially modulates this relationship between resistive and conductive heating. You essentially get wider lesions that are slightly less shallower, but often are necrotic because of the temperatures reached. And we have the first in human trial um, reported of very high power, short duration, but temperature, cold le uh, temperature controlled lesions, which is very important because if you have too much temperature heating of the electrode, you'll get uh, char formation. Uh, and of course, of the tissue, you'll get steam pops. So in terms of uh, persistent AF, we have already alluded to this earlier today, that mapping of AF seems to be um, a very important area to try and understand. The first study in this arena, the FIRM study in 2012, brought along lots of excitement, i.e. targeting areas of interest which are personalized in addition to PVI. But it seemed that those results were not consistent and therefore interest in those areas have fallen by the wayside. But development has continued. And so we have uh, new technologies such as Carto Finder and the dipole density technology looking at interesting areas, rotational activity, which if targeted has been shown that it can potentially terminate AF, although we are in the early phase of, in, uh, of investigation of these techniques. So what's around the corner? Well, lots of things around the corner, but I've, I've just uh, put up some images of something interesting that I've seen. So <coughs> there is the ability to potentially uh, visualize uh, using near field ultrasound on the RF catheter, your lesion formation in real time. This has been studied in early preclinical data in animals, as yet to see uh, or yet to be tested in humans, but certainly very exciting. This system down here is um, very exciting. This is a RF-based system with a sphere-like catheter with a large surface area. Uh, it has its own 3D mapping system and power generator and essentially allows you to deliver high power but at a lower current density. Uh, and early work has shown that you can really minimize your RF times uh, and you can get excellent contiguity of your lesions and you can even modulate the depth of the lesions conducted. So this could be very good, for example, in the ventricle as well. We've seen a lot of uh, work with cryoablation. This is a uh, new technology. This is ultra low temperature cryoablation, which uses a, a type of nitrogen at a certain point, which is near vapor uh, and liquid. The advantage of this is that it can be used in a much more smaller catheter design compared to current conventional cryoablation. And furthermore, this catheter can not only be shaped in a loop, it can be linear, it can be in a pouch shape. So there's lots of potential permutations. And early data has been uh, accrued already and shows lots of promise. But the one uh, thing that's really caught my attention in the last couple of years is something called electroporation. It's essentially revisiting old technology. Um, in the olden days, or rather early days of uh, catheter ablation, very high voltage um, ablation was conducted using a single pulse. This is now being uh, re-tested uh, using um, the same high voltages, but in very, very fast uh, delivery of milliseconds, which produces 
nanoscale pores in the cell membrane and causes cell death. It's a non-thermal technique, and the beauty of it is that it has myocardial selectivity, so the potential for no damage to collateral structures such as nerves, arteries, uh, veins, and the esophagus. This is the publication from earlier this year, pulsed field ablation, as it was called in the publication. 81 patients um, with uh, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation tested by a group. Um, and essentially, early results show that you get very, very high rates of durable PVI, an amazing safety profile with only one, uh, I think, complication in those 80% of patients, which are not due to collateral structure damage. Uh, and this is certainly an area that I think we need to keep an eye on because it could, uh, we could have a, a non-thermal energy source which does not cause uh, damage to adjacent structures. And there is, just to say, plenty of animal data to back up those safety uh, claims from electroporation. And just finally, this is probably around many corners, but this is a paper published earlier this year looking at computational guided techniques in order to target uh, ablation sources, uh, ablation areas rather, in persistent atrial fibrillation. And this is quite complicated, but in essence, it looks at using um, whole atrial virtual simulation models to try and predict where, if you ablate, would you get termination of atrial arrhythmias. And they use personalization techniques, i.e. they import real-life patient uh, data into these virtual simulations such as anatomy and fibrosis data from LG MRI, and use that to personalize the virtual models, tar uh, uh, define target areas of ablation, and the proof of concept study was published this year of 10 patients of persi persistent atrial fibrillation with very, very uh, encouraging results. So in conclusion, I think there's been significant advances in the last 20 years with lots of technological advancements but I think we are somewhat in a plateau in terms of improving our outcomes and safety. There's an exciting transition period that awaits, and maybe we will see a paradigm shift that we often hear about in the next five to 10 years. Thank you, Tom. Thank you to the organizers. So I will argue that um, one shot balloon ablation should be our default approach for all index AF ablation procedures. <laughs> So there are a variety of one-shot balloon technologies available and coming. So the current technologies are the cryo balloon from Medtronic, laser balloon, cardiofocus, and the PVAC, the pulmonary vein ablation catheter from Medtronic. In the next year or so, it will become an increasingly crowded market. Everyone, a lot of other companies are rushing to join the market because it is a hugely expanding market. So another cryo system from Boston, RF balloons from Biosense in Boston, and then Pulse DC or the exploration as, as Shovek just, just um, spoke about, and various other things potentially on the way. I will focus today's talk on the cryo balloon from Medtronic. Um, it is the most widely used single shot technology um, with half a million procedures undertaken worldwide. And it has the most evidence available. So the effectiveness of the balloon in PAF from single studies is very similar across a multitude of studies from a multitude of centers with different dosing protocols with success, really between 75 up to 95% with a single procedure. We'll discuss safety. So Safety from the balloon compared to point-by-point -point radio frequency ablation. So in this study, in this study, there was similar safety across most things, a trend to more tamponade in RF procedures, and a clear increase in phrenic nerve palsy in the uh, in the cryo cases. Um, phrenic nerve palsy is apparently specific to cryo and certainly the rates with time have got a lot better. So in the very early work with the cryo balloon when people were using both the 23 and the 28 millimeter balloon. I think now the very few people use the 23 millimeter balloon at all. With the 23 millimeter balloon, the, the rates of phrenic nerve palsy were up nearly as high as 
But when people started to just use the 28, these 28 millimeter balloon, these result, these rates of threatening nerve injury came right down. Um, and as time has gone by, we've got much better at avoiding phrenic nerve palsy. So in the past few years, I think we should be aiming for phrenic nerve palsy rates at around 1%. So we've understood how to monitor the phrenic nerve during cryoablations, how to come off and deflate the balloon suddenly to reduce the risk, and also pacing in different places in the SVC to capture the phrenic. However, Phrenic nerve palsy is generally reversible. So although patients um, <coughs> may be breathless, it will nearly always recover. Permanent phrenic nerve palsy is very unusual. Um, and do we really know what the risk of phrenic nerve palsy with point by point RF is? The rate would appear low, but actually do we really know? It's not routinely monitored during point by point RF cases. Tamponade. This was uh, a single set of center comparison from Frankfurt, looking at their PVI point by point cases versus their balloon cases. And they found a, a significant difference between patients going PVI plus PVI plus extra ablation. So from 3% to 0.8%, a significant difference and also significantly more tamponade in the RF group compared to the cryo group. Esophageal injury, global survey of, of fistulas seems they had a relatively low rate of fistulas and no clear difference between cryo and RF. Although the numbers are small, it is difficult to split any difference, but the numbers in both groups appear small. Efficacy of the single shot cryo balloon in paroxysmal AF. I think the fire and eye study is a difficult study to interpret there were multiple different technologies used during the study. Um, contact force, no contact force, first generation balloon, second generation balloon, which made the study long and difficult to, it was long recruitment, although there appeared to be no overall difference between the two technologies. More recently, there have been better studies. So the circa dose study presented this year with smart touch RF and the next generation cryo, cryo balloon with loop recorders in all patients. Seemingly very, diff very little difference between the three groups. So this is symptomatic AF, similar between the three groups, and then any AF on ILR. So this was any, any 30 second or longer episode of AF on the loop recorder. So again, very similar results between smart touch, contact force ablation and the next generation cryo balloon. Um, Mark may tell us that actually, well, RF is better than this. So there are a whole bunch of new things that are round the corner, high power, short duration, closed protocol, new RF cultures, uh, catheters, ultra high power. How, and some of these results, initial results look quite promising and apparently more improved results and longer lasting PVI with these improved protocol with RF. Um, however, there is still no comparison between these new techniques and cryo. So for paroxysmal AF, my view is that the results from point by point RF ablation and from a one shot cryo balloon seem similar. These novel RF techniques look promising, but they are yet unproven against cryo. Well, let me go forward. Persistent AF. So within persistent AF, the guidelines and the statements recommend PVI during the index catheter ablation procedures in patients with persistent AF. Stop the STAR AF study. We all, this is a, a frequently shown illustration that apparently no difference between pulmonary vein isolation alone, pulmonary vein isolation plus electrograms primary vein isolation plus linear ablation. So no benefit from additional ablation beyond pulmonary vein isolation. So can we do more than PVI? There have been a multitude of approaches. So electrograms, boxes, lines, appendage isolation, surgical procedures, ganglionic plexi, voltage-based, scar-based. However, 
these remain unproven, variable results, and although single center studies may have shown improvements in, with some of these techniques, they've generally not been reproducible. So just as a reminder, the guidelines say that for PVI alone during the index ablation procedure in patients with persistent AF is a reasonable first step. So what other benefits does cryo balloon-based ablation give us over RF? So we'll talk, I will talk about general anesthetic versus sedation, procedure time, x-ray dosing and staffing. So RF point by point is painful with sedation. So in a survey we did at the heart, two thirds of patients found the procedure painful and a third of patients found it much more painful than expected and unacceptably painful. And also to achieve a good RF point by point, patients do need to lie still. And actually in, in RF ablations, general anaesthetic has been shown to improve single procedure success, lower the prevalence of, redo, of PV reconnection, reduce the rate of redo procedures, shorten the x-ray time and shorten the procedure time. However, cryo is easily performed with sedation. Patients don't need to be super still. It, isn't, it is performed without significant patient discomfort. And there has been no suggestion that the success is any different with sedation versus general anaesthetic and cryo. We may hear that actually cryo, we are killing all of our cryo patients with x-rays, a, a move to try to do zero fluoroscopy procedures. Why do we want to do this? Is actually the x-ray dose during a cryo ablation important or significant? So with simple measures, and if you take your x-ray seriously, you can decrease x-ray doses. So minimizing acquisition, changing frame rate, decreasing x-ray quality. And it, across a variety of studies using cryoablation, we can see a vast range of x-ray doses. So up to 5,000. And then with, with modest changes in the x-ray technique, able to drop it to 1,500. And locally in Brighton with our x-ray techniques, we see our dose at around 300. And that compares to a coronary angiogram and a CT coronary angiogram of nearer 3,000. So the dose is a tenth of that of a coronary angiogram. So actually, is this x-ray dose really relevant? Procedure times. So our procedure times now in Brighton as a, a large volume experience center with this one-shot balloon with time have got better. And over the past two years, we have a mean procedure time of just less than one hour. And I'm not aware of any RF data that, that can match that. In the, in the circa dose study, unsurprisingly, the cryo procedures were shorter than the RF procedures, although disappointingly long compared to, uh, compared to a lot of other studies. So staffing. In RF, you need complex mapping systems, complex catheters, highly skilled physiologists, and not all centers are able to offer this, and it can be difficult to find suitably trained staff. With cryo, the setup and case management is simple, and it also gives an avenue for junior physiologists to get into EP. You start with some cryo cases, it's interesting, and then they can move on to the more complex type work. So despite all this fantastic evidence that single shot technology is the correct way to do all of our index AF ablations, why on earth don't we? And I frequently ask this of colleagues and I get a variety of answers from boring. It's not what I got into EP to do. I like the concept of zero fluoroscopy. It's not real EP. And more recently, the, the, the feeling that point by point RF is better with these, new, with these new ablation technologies. However, they do remain unproven. So to summarize, 
Comparing a one-shot balloon to point-by-point -point RF safety is broadly similar. Results are similar in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. If PVI is your strategy and persistent AF, which we are told is the right thing to do, a one-shot one technique is very reasonable, and there's nothing to suggest the results will be any different from, from PAF. However, the one-shot cryo is quicker. It's reliably done without general anesthetic and requires less physiologists. So in our, resor our resource-limited healthcare system, it should be the default option for all index AF ablations. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, my distinguished opponent, uh, the motion that we're here to discuss is that this House believes that one shot and or balloon ablation should be the approach for all index AF ablation procedures. And I'm here to oppose that motion and to convince you that it is incorrect. Dr. McGreedy is a master debater <laughs> and has diverted your attention from the motion at hand, which is not a motion about cryo-balloon ablation versus any other form of ablation. And that's what a debate is. He has demonstrated the fine art of using the most words possible to not answer a direct question. Let's look at what we've been asked to answer. That one shot or balloon ablation should, meaning obligation, duty, or it's the correct thing to do, approach for all index AF ablation procedures. All is a very unambiguous word. It means all index ablation AF procedures. And I would draw your attention also to the fact that one shot and balloon are not necessarily the same thing. What I think you have heard is a very elegant exposition of the use of the cryo balloon as a tool in catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation, but little else about all of the other one-shot and balloon ablation techniques. So in order for this motion to be carried, you have to agree that no patient with atrial fibrillation should have the index procedure performed with anything other than a one-shot or balloon device. Now, why might this be proposed? Well, either a one-shot or balloon device is clearly better, or alternative technology is clearly worse. And here's the problem. The problem is that the only manifestation that we have of atrial fibrillation is this. This is our disease classification. You either have this or you don't have this. We have been researching this arrhythmia for over 100 years, and we still don't know how to treat it because its reactions to treatment are so almost peculiarly its own, as said by Sir Thomas Lewis. And so multiple different strategies with multiple different tools have been tried to treat atrial fibrillation, and multiple different tools have failed to treat many patients with atrial fibrillation. But if I were to get off my high horse and ask you what is this debate really about, it's about what Dr. McCready pointed out, which is, is pulmonary vein isolation alone an appropriate first treatment for all AF types? And then the second part of that has to be, is a balloon or single shot device the best way, however you choose to define best, procedure duration, amount of fluoroscopy, number of patients you get through your lab, is it the best way to achieve this endpoint? So let's look at the first question. We all love to see patients like this. We love it so much that we all have a slide of this because it almost never happens. <laughs> this is the Wolf Parkinson White of catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation. You see this. The patient has a PVI. After their PVI, you can see that they have no more atrial fibrillation. It literally is like ablating an accessory pathway because you understand the mechanism of atrial fibrillation in that patient. This is a real 33-year-old with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, the typical phenotype that you see in your outpatient clinic. Here's another 33-year-old with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation who presents to your clinic with multiple frequent short episodes of atrial fibrillation who comes for his catheter ablation procedure in atrial flutter, and so for that reason you choose one technology over another. You ablate his cavotracuspidismus after confirming its typical flutter, you go into his left atrium, and then you do a voltage map of his left atrium as you're creating a shell to do your ablation procedure, and this is what you find. I don't know what the right treatment for this patient is, but I think pulmonary vein isolation alone, or any form of ablation, may be the wrong treatment for this patient. Our level of sophistication in deciding how to treat our patients is very, very low. When we talk about patients with heart failure and cardiomyopathy, 
We talk about multiple potential causes of those things. We don't think the same way about atrial fibrillation. We think about it simply as, can I isolate pulmonary vein to the single shot device, or do I need to do something more in this patient? But we don't understand the disease. You've seen this slide at least four times in the last hour and a half. And what this slide tells us is that all the treatments we have are lousy for persistent atrial fibrillation. It doesn't tell us that one's not better than the other. In fact, it tells us that, but all are equally bad. If I was a patient being told that I was going to have a procedure that carried a risk of complication and a likelihood of success, maybe after whatever number of procedures, no matter what tool you use, as has been pointed out, of only 70% or 60% or 50%, then I would think very hard about having that procedure performed on me. More selective targets are needed, and we're not going to find those selective targets without looking beyond single shot devices. Having anticipated that Dr. McCready would talk a little bit more about cryoballoon than the other devices, I've also had a look at the literature comparing the cryoballoon to radiofrequency ablation, which uh, is not the only other single shot, uh, the only other non-single shot device available. And this was the best, most recent study I could find. This is the Freeze Registry from Germany, looking at over 5,000 patients. It's an interesting study because centers were recruited and allowed to recruit to one arm of the study only, either cryoballoon ablation or radiofrequency. So you weren't allowed to chop and change in the center. If you're in the study, your center only did one or the other. And what it showed was, exactly as Dr. McCready has said, the outcomes are pretty similar in these groups of patients, whether you use the cryoballoon or whether you use radiofrequency energy. But let's dig a little bit deeper at the patients that were undergoing ablation with these technologies. And what it clearly reveals is an unconscious bias among operators as to which technology they will choose. So the cryoballoon only centers, and remember, they've entered into the study and then selected their patients, not the other way around. All have a lower incidence of coronary disease, valve disease, renal impairment, lower chads vast scores, and are younger than the patients who underwent radiofrequency ablation. So already in operators' minds, there seems to be some sort of unconscious bias that a particular technology type might be appropriate for a particular patient type. What's also interesting, if you look on the left side of this slide, is that patients who were more highly symptomatic were in the radiofrequency arm of this study, whereas the patients in the cryobloom arm were less often in high symptom score categories. And the improvement in symptom scores, therefore, was more dramatic for patients undergoing radiofrequency ablation, the sicker, if you like, group of patients based on their comorbidities. So I will concede, on the basis of what Dr. McCready has presented, that pulmonary vein isolation as the sole intervention at the index procedure is reasonable in many AF patients. The data support that, the consensus statement supports that. But it is a fact that pulmonary vein isolation as the sole intervention at the index procedure is not effective in all patients and therefore cannot be the appropriate way forward. Are balloon or single shot devices the best way to achieve the endpoint we've discussed? Well, this has been missed completely, other than in the opening slide to say that they exist. There are two cryoballoon manufacturers on the market. Then there are cryocatheter manufacturers on the market. Then there is an electroporation balloon manufacturer entering the market. There is the laser balloon. There is the hot balloon. Then there are the uh, duty uh, RF uh, phased uh, cycle um, devices. There is the now discontinued irrigated multi-electrode device. There are radio frequency balloons. And there's the globe. So in this debate, which one are we talking about? We're not talking about any one in particular. We're talking about single shot devices as a whole. Far more importantly, and with this I totally agree with Dr. McGreedy, is by whom is the procedure performed and where is the procedure performed? Procedural complications and outcome depend on center profile, patient profile, and efficacy of the procedure you perform. The center profile includes things like a highly experienced cryo operator like Dr. McCready, a very effective team working around him, and an environment in which it is possible to do procedures in as effective and as efficient a way as you can. However, patients differ. There are patients with higher risk scores, older patients, heart failure patients, and female patients more at risk of complications related to procedures. And finally, your efficacy is very important. If your efficacy is better with one technology over another technology, fewer redo procedures means fewer complications. 
So how do you choose your technology then? Well, I think these are probably the five criteria you should be thinking about. The one which carries the greatest chance of benefit, and that's probably disease dependent. The one which has the most sustained effect is possibly disease dependent, is probably technology dependent, but is also system dependent as to how you deliver that technology. And after that, the complication rate, the cost effectiveness, and the widest applicability are really system dependent, and some of that is political. You've seen this slide three or four times, the fire and ice study. And what the fire and ice study confirms is that cryoablation and radiofrequency ablation are equivalent in the way in which they were done in the study. Dr. McCready was very quick to gloss over the fact, or he mentioned it, that there were discrepancies in the types of uh, cryoballoon and radiofrequency energy used in this study. But actually, the second ger generation cryoballoon, which is the one that was, is most widely used, was used for 75% of the cryo patients. And a contact force sensing catheter was only used for 25% of the patients. So it's not really a fair comparison. And the hype about procedure duration, well, the procedure duration in cryo and ORF procedures is about 15 or 20 minutes different, unless you're an expert in using the technology that you choose to use. And like Dr. McCready, if you are an expert in using cryoballoon treatment, then you can get your procedure times down to under an hour. And that is why this statement states that catheter ablation should target isolation of the pulmonary veins using either radiofrequency ablation or cryotherapy balloon ablation. It doesn't say anything about any other single shot devices. A very recent review looking at the relative merits of radiofrequency versus cryoballoon uh, looked at 11 studies in the radiofrequency group and 20 studies in the cryoballoon group. And really, Dr. McCready is an outlier in that his procedure times are so short, and that's fantastic. And I know that this is the experience in other centers where they have focused very much on the workflow in how to deliver their therapy. Typically, you're looking at 15, 20 minutes difference between these procedure types. Interestingly, there may be other explanations for that. If you look at the consensus statement published in 2017, these are the techniques used by the consensus writers to improve durable PVI. In red, you will see the numbers for the radio frequency operators. In blue, you will see the numbers for the cryo operators. And you can see that a 20 to 30 minute waiting time is reasonable, according to radio frequency operators, for 80% of those people, but only for 50% of cryo operators. So already, those procedure durations are longer because people are waiting to look for recovery. Adenosine testing is much less frequently performed by cryo operators than radio frequency energy operators. Obviously, other measures of endpoint, like loss of pace capture on the line, can't be done using a single shot device like a cryo balloon. And exit block is not as often checked for in cryo balloon operators as it is by radio frequency operators. It is possible to achieve very good outcomes with a point by point ablation device. That is my point in this debate. If you apply the same level of rigor that Dr. McCready applies in his unit to the use of a single shot device, you may not be able to achieve radio frequency ablation times in the region of an hour, but you won't be far beyond it. Certainly, 80 to 90 minutes is very achievable. I'm not going to dwell on this point. There's little point in dwelling on it because short power, a short du um, duration, high power ablation only shortens the bit of the procedure that is the energy delivery. And the energy delivery for a pulmonary vein isolation is somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes if you're doing the procedure well. So you can shorten that bit of the procedure with high power, short duration. But actually, all of you working in an EP lab know the delivery of energy is the shortest time in the procedure where you lose time. Most of the lost time in the procedure is everything else that's happening around the ablation procedure, getting the patient into the lab in time, on the table in time, getting things scrubbed in time, getting the patient, uh, getting the ablation done, and then getting the patient out of the lab and the next patient in. This is a step forward, but it's certainly not the answer to reduce our procedure times from somewhere in the region of 90 to 120 minutes for radio frequency down to what can be achieved with cryoballoon. So I will concede to Dr. McCready that a cryoballoon that's the only one we've had evidence presented for today, but a balloon or single shot device may be the best way to achieve pulmonary vein isolation by an individual operator and lab team in a particular patient. But it is a fact that it will not be the best way to achieve pulmonary vein isolation by all operators and lab teams in all patients. And the proof of that is the fact 
that the vast majority of single-shot device publications in the literature and cryoballoon have procedure times that are twice as long as Dr. McCready's procedure times. Upton Sinclair won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction with his novel Oil, on which the film There Will Be Blood was based. It's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. If you look for Dr. McCready on Google, he keeps a very low profile. But you can find this. This is Dr. McCready and, uh, uh, speaking at the Medtronic-sponsored symposium at ERA in 2018. And in this, Dr. McCready is detailing some of what you've seen today. Some of the slides are very similar to the slides that you've seen today on his use of the cry balloon over the course of the last five or six years. And the frequency with which he is using that balloon has increased to the point where now it represents 50% of patients with persistent atrial fibrillation undergoing a cry balloon ablation. But what is the motion? The motion is not it's reasonable to use a cry balloon in 50% of patients undergoing catheter ablation who have atrial fibrillation. The motion is it's reasonable to use it in 100% of patients undergoing catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation. So if Dr. McCready doesn't believe what he's saying, and I don't believe what he's saying, then how can we possibly expect you to believe what he is saying? I will sound a note of caution, and Jack did allude to this, and I think this is an important point, and it's one that I feel is probably going to steamroller over somebody like me. But it's clear we don't fully understand all the mechanisms for AF in all patients. PVI, as a result of that, has become the mainstay of AF ablation. It must be and is the accepted approach for the vast majority of patients with atrial fibrillation. But the word of caution is the second part of this. Instead of comparing marginally effective empirical strategies that depend on unreliable lesion durability and now perhaps increasingly reliable lesion durability, in the future we will have learned to focus on understanding an individual patient-specific anatomy and electrophysiology, a purely anatomic approach for the treatment of arrhythmias, particularly atrial fibrillation, without consideration to mechanism, completes our transition from true electrophysiologists to ablationists, as fearfully described by Mark Josephson a decade ago. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to hold back the tide of time with single shot devices, but please, in using them, do not neglect your duty as electrophysiologists with a focus on electrophysiology. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I, I, the, the, the one point I think was unfair was to say that the, the 50 percent of uh, persistent cases being done with radio frequency, that includes redo procedures. And the debate was for the index procedure and not for the redo procedure. And there's no suggestion that these single shot technologies should be used for redo procedures. Thank you. Good. Could I just have the slides up again, please? Um, <laughs> so what I would say in response to that particular point is that there is a vogue now for advocating the use of a single shot device for redo procedures. And I can't understand that. And you can't understand that clearly either. Because if it has failed once uh, and, you've, and you're an expert operator and you've done everything you can do to use that device effectively, then the likelihood of it working the second time round it contradicts exactly what Albert Einstein, or reinforces exactly what he said uh, when he said that if you expect to get a different result doing the same thing every time, then you're a fool. And uh, neither Jack nor I is a fool. I just want to get to the end of this. Because I, I did email and ask, would we have time for a bottle? And uh, didn't get a response, so I assumed we would. And I just wanted to make a point, which I think uh, is not really in con contradiction of anything that uh, Jack has said, and in fact it's reinforcing what he has said and what, what I am saying, which is that the pursuit of excellence is what we should be after. It's not about uh, focusing on a technology and saying my technology is good and your technology is bad. It's about the patient in front of you using the technology that you are most capable of using to the greatest possible effect. So you may not be able to see the detail on that, but if you look at the slide on the right, that is a running track. And what you can see on the right of that running track here is Usain Bolt and his time for the 100 meters in 2012 at the Olympics. And what you can see here is every other medalist in every other Olympic Games running the 100 meters back into the uh, 1800s. 
And what can you see about the times for running the 100 meters? Well, you can see that it's a linear increase. These aren't suddenly gifted athletes that appear out of nowhere, that suddenly run faster than anybody else has ever run before. It's an incremental change. And that incremental change is exactly what you've done in your lab and what we seek to do in our lab. You look at what best practice is, and then you try to get better than best practice. You measure, you improve, you measure again, and you improve again. So I think the debate over single shot versus RF or whatever technology you choose to use is a futile debate. What it's really about is what is the treatment you want to deliver and can you deliver it in the best possible way? Because effectively, the complications and outcomes are, this, are similar at the moment to the way that we use these technologies. So just focus on getting better. I agree that pulmonary vein isolation is a proven strategy for selected patients, and it's reasonable to argue that you don't have to select the patients, that you could just use it as a strategy in any patient. I don't like that approach to electrophysiology, where you just say, I don't know what's wrong with you, I'm just going to do this. There are lots of different techniques and technologies, and each has their own strengths and weaknesses, and we've heard some of the strengths and weaknesses of point-by-point -point versus cryotechnology today. But there really isn't um, any equivocal, uh, unequivocal evidence for a patient-specific approach or a target-specific approach beyond pulmonary vein isolation at the moment, and that I agree with. And remember that when you're reading the literature, the literature is not your unit's literature. So Jack's literature, Jack's unit's literature is not representative of what's in the literature. That is uh, incredible to be able to do an AF ablation in under one hour. And for radio frequency, it is going to be slower, but you can get it down into uh, at least half of what you see in the published literature uh, as the standard radio frequency catheter ablation times. Um, thank you.